Hey, housekeeper, take care of this. As soon as I got home, Michael threw his bag at me and gave the order. Lately, I've lost the energy to fight back, so I just picked up the bag from the floor. Scattered papers and a planer were spread out. This chocolate must be his snack for when he gets a little hungry. I picked them up and put them back in the bag. But among them, there was one document that stood out. It was a divorce paper. Moreover, Michael's part was already filled in. At that moment, something inside me crumbled. Aha, I can divorce this man. With that thought, I suddenly felt lighter. And then, I immediately took out a pen from the drawer and started filling out the divorce form. My name is Linda Smith, 35 years old. I work as an administrative assistant at an IT company. Fortunately, I am blessed with good co-workers and a pleasant work environment, and I am happy that I can live without major stress. Ist for me, who quit my first job due to stress from human relations, my current company feels very comfortable. If nothing goes wrong, I'll probably work here for a long time. I've been thinking about this more and more. But I have a problem. I can't even get a boyfriend, let alone get married. It's not that I haven't had any opportunities to meet someone. There were company drinking parties and blind dates my friends invited me to. I've had many chances to interact with men. In fact, most of my friends are married and even have children. So why not me? Do I have some crucial problem? Every time my friends announce their marriages, I agonize to the point of getting a headache. But then, my chance came. It was at a company drinking party. As usual, I was sipping my drink when a man sat next to me. That was the man who would become my husband, Michael. Linda, right? Arst Mavius. How do you know my name? Michael, who suddenly spoke to me. We were in different departments, so we had never talked before. I knew his name and that he was older and joined the company earlier than me, but nothing more. Um, Prishtis. Oh, sorry. I just started talking to you out of the blue. Seeing my surprise, Michael explained why he had started talking to me and introduced himself. Apparently, he had been concerned about me always being alone at company drinks and during breaks. I hadn't thought of myself as being alone that much, but I guess that's how it appeared to others. After that, Michael and I continued our conversation without any awkwardness, thanks in part to the alcohol. At the end of the drinking party, we exchanged contact information, thinking, why not? From that day on, Michael and I started talking more at work. We couldn't talk much during work hours, but we chatted during breaks and after work. Sometimes, if we bumped into each other at the nearest station, we would go to the office together. We would go to the office together. As we continued this routine, we naturally grew closer and started dating after going out for drinks more often. Eventually, our relationship became known at work. My peers and juniors were quite surprised, as they had not expected me to date Michael. Michael remained the same even after we started dating. He was always kind and cheerful. Being with him felt comfortable, and I found myself increasingly attracted to him. I thought Michael seemed happier too, and that made me feel good. About six months into our relationship, Michael told me something. Hey, I actually have a kid. A kid? Michael had been married before, but divorced due to personality differences. He had custody and was raising his middle school age child as a single father. I've been thinking. I'd like to marry you someday, Linda. I had to tell you before it's too late. Sorry for springing this on you all of a sudden. I was definitely surprised, but I was also happy that Michael was thinking about marrying me and had shared his past and his child's existence, considering our future. Thank you for telling me, I said to Michael. After that, I started meeting Michael's child more often. His name is Noah. I thought he might reject me, being a middle schooler, but Noah accepted me easily. A year later, Michael and I got married. I felt an unprecedented exhilaration and joy at being united with the person I loved. I was truly glad I had not turned Michael away at that drinking party. However, my happiness was short-lived. After we got married, Michael's true nature gradually became apparent. After discussing it with Michael, I quit my job. It had been a fun workplace, but I was not overly attached to it. I decided to make a fresh start and stay at home. That meant my activities were mostly limited to housework and shopping. Having no particular hobbies, I spent my days without much to immerse myself in. But even I found a hobby eventually. It was painting. I started with pencil drawings out of curiosity, but soon got into watercolors. Before I knew it, my room was filled with watercolor paints, palettes, and brushes. I wonder if this is when Michael started acting strangely. Or maybe it is more accurate to say he started showing his true colors. 
The first sign of something amiss was when Michael left laundry scattered about. Hey, could you please put the laundry in the basket? Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. Since we had not lived together before marriage, it was not surprising that some sloppiness surfaced. I'm not perfect either. In fact, I was happy that Michael, who had always seemed so proper, was showing me this side of himself. It made me feel like we were really married. But no matter how much I asked Michael to put the laundry in the basket, he never seemed to make an effort. In fact, he started saying, I'm tired from work, you could do it right? But as soon as I started doing it, Michael began taking advantage of me. What about dinner? That day too, as soon as he got home, Michael demanded his meal. I told you, didn't I? Dinner's gonna be late today because Noah's coming home late. I said, I didn't hear that. Are you sure you said it? I didn't say it. No, I definitely didn't hear it. My words fell on deaf ears and Michael became moody. Dealing with a moody Michael is tough. He would ignore me when I spoke to him, handle things roughly and stomp around. This behavior was stressing me out and it bothered me how he'd get in a bad mood over minor things. At first I thought, maybe he's just tired today and tolerated it, but as the days passed, it became unbearable and I started to speak up more. Hey, didn't I tell you to stop leaving your bag around? Sometimes things fall out and it's dangerous. If you're gonna say that, then you clean it up. I'm tired from working every day. Exit unlike you, a stay-at-home wife who does nothing all day. Wait, what's with that tone? Anyway, if I don't bring home the bacon, there'd be no food or house for you. I thought we agreed, I would quit my job. Oh yes, yes. You're so annoying. Our conversation went nowhere. Am we saying something wrong? Do we really deserve to be yelled at like this? Every time I argued with Michael, I doubted my own judgment. He told me his divorce from his ex-wife was due to personality differences, but I began to suspect if that was really the case. Maybe the problem was with Michael, and his ex-wife initiated the divorce. Could I bring up divorce myself? The answer is no. I just finally gotten married. And now, having quit my job, the idea of going back to being single and independent was daunting. And I worried about Noah. The idea of his father divorcing and remarrying must be stressful. For now, I was relieved that Michael didn't raise his voice in front of Noah. It's wrong to think he can do anything in front of me, but it's good that he behaves normally in front of Noah, a basic expectation of a parent, but still, I'm grateful. I should just endure everything. It's my fault for ending up with such a man. Eventually, that thought began to dominate my mind. It's about six months into our marriage, Michael started coming home extremely late. Although there was some overtime at his company, staying out until late at night was not typical. Yet Michael would text me, I'm gonna be late tonight. It might even be past midnight. It's good he contacts me, but what is he doing until late at night? Or could he be cheating? Just after we got married, I often thought so. But without proof or certainty, I hesitated. And there was one thing that made me think maybe he wasn't cheating. It was that Michael would bring his colleagues home. Moreover, they were a man and a woman. Their names were apparently Mitch Johnson and Emily Thompson. Mitch was very refreshing, the epitome of a fine young man. Emily was adorable, and even though we were not close in age, it was fun talking to her. Both of them were in the same department as Michael, so they were not exactly acquaintances. Therefore, I was initially unsure how to interact when they first came over, but as they visited more often, we became friendly. Linda, let me help you wash the dishes. Oh, you don't have to do that. No, please. I want to help since I'm visiting. Really? Well then, I'd appreciate your help. Emily often helped with washing the dirty dishes and glasses, and preparing drinks and snacks, while Mitch would talk to or take care of Michael when he was drunk. Honestly, if it weren't for Mitch and Emily coming over, I would have to entertain by myself, and that would be quite a hassle. Mr. Smith, you're drinking too much. Don't make your wife worry, okay? Ah, it's fine. She's okay with it. While Emily and I were in the kitchen, such conversations would sometimes drift over to us. Given his past behavior, I thought Michael really didn't care about me, but Emily surprised me with her comment. It's because of a good relationship between spouses that he can say such things. Huh, was Jockley? Mr. Smith always talks about you, me now. Saying things like how delicious last night's dinner was, or how you always care for him and make him feel comfortable at home. I couldn't believe Michael was saying such things. Michael talks about me like that? Yes. He talks about home every day. It sounds so fun. I wish I could have a wonderful family like Michael's. Is that so? 
My feelings were complicated. My home life was anything but fun. I didn't want anyone to aspire to have a family like mine. But I guess Michael had to maintain his image at work. I didn't reveal the truth, just quietly listened to Emily's stories. Well, it's understandable to think it's a happy home if you don't know the inside story. At the dinner table with Michael, Noah would also occasionally join in our conversations, making the atmosphere very pleasant. Mitch and Emily were always kind to Noah. Noah's in middle school, right? Yes, he's in middle school. Balsa no chokraktik, Noah, you're still young too, aren't you? I found such conversations very enjoyable. On the days Mitch and Emily visited, I felt quite relieved. At first, Michael brought Mitch and Emily over without telling me. Honestly, it was hard to accept at the beginning. But I'm glad I didn't turn them away. However, Michael's attitude didn't change, even when Mitch and Emily were there. Being with his subordinates and under the influence of alcohol. Alcohol, he never seemed to be in a bad mood, which was good. But seriously, my what? She's totally useless. A drunk, Michael began showing his true nature. Mitch and Emily seemed to take his words as a joke. Come on, Mr. Smith. What are you joking about? Your wife is a wonderful person, isn't she? Right, Emily. Yeah, really admirable. No, you shouldn't admire someone like her. You'll regret it in the future. Come on, Michael, you drunk again. Mitch and Emily seemed to think Michael was disparaging me because he was drunk. Indeed, they probably thought so, because they always heard good things about me at work. But I knew they meant no harm. I had become accustomed to Michael speaking ill of me, so I could only smile quietly along with them. Years later, time flew by and Noah graduated from middle school, then high school, and went on to college in the city. After four years, he graduated and started working for a local company, renting a house near our home. Initially, I suggested he could live with us, but Noah wanted to experience living alone. I respected his wishes and accepted his decision. Michael's behavior remained the same. By this time, he had been promoted to department head and seemed to have more subordinates than before. He sighed more and became more careless with things. But his attitude towards me didn't get worse. I thought he might take out his accumulated stress on me. As usual, Michael often brought Mitch and Emily over for drinks and he started coming home after midnight more often than before. I figured he was probably relieving his stress in his own way. Then, after a few more years, I received a call from Noah. Mama, I'm getting married. Beist, beist, congratulations. I, I couldn't believe Noah was getting married. Time really flies. It seems like just yesterday he was in middle school. He told Michael about it too, and Michael seemed happy. From that day, preparations for the wedding began, including helping with arrangements and meeting his fiance. Michael was busy, so I was mainly the one helping out. During the planning, we decided to invite Mitch and Emily as they had been a great help. They both attended the wedding, looking very smart, and once again, they took care of a drunk Michael. Honestly, it was embarrassing to have him drunk at such an event, but thankfully, Mitch and Emily handled it well, preventing any awkwardness. Especially Emily, who stayed close to Michael the whole time. They seemed to have a lot of physical contact, but maybe Emily was just a bit drunk. I didn't mind and just watched them. After a few hours, the wedding ended, and Michael and I headed home. He must have had a lot to drink. Michael slept in the back seat all the way home. When we got home and entered the living room, Michael suddenly threw his bag at me. Ochibai, what are you doing? I turned to look at Michael, and he was chuckling. Hey, housekeeper, take care of this. Told so, I looked at the bag on the floor. Exhausted as I was, I didn't argue and just picked up the bag. Scattered around were documents and a planner. Maybe this chocolate is for when he gets a little hungry. I gathered them and put them back in the bag. But then, I found something unusual. It was a divorce paper. Moreover, Michael's part was already filled in. What is this? The moment I saw the divorce papers, time seemed to stop. But then, I composed myself. Looking at Michael, he was already asleep drunk. That's right. Why was I still trying to live with Michael? Noah was employed and married now, so there was no need to stay for the family's sake. Realizing this, something inside me crumbled. Is this his way of saying we should sort out our relationship too? I couldn't stop myself. I took out a pen from the drawer, filled in my part, and left the house with the minimum necessary belongings. I went straight to the office L and submitted the divorce papers. The divorce between Michael and me was finalized. 
I couldn't believe Michael had prepared divorce papers, wanting to end our marriage. All my efforts over the years felt in vain. As in leaving the office, I headed to a motel to stay for a while. After checking in, I went to the room. Overwhelmed by exhaustion, without even taking a bath, I fell asleep. The next morning, it wasn't an alarm or voices that woke me, but my phone ringing. It was Michael's name on the screen. I stepped out of the booth to a quiet spot. Hello, Pink. As your questions, where are you? I'm at a motel. Why are you at a motel? Stickly come to my home. I home the cataclyst. We're not a couple anymore. Beef. Michael must not have expected me to file for divorce. We're not a couple anymore. But you know the divorce papers in your bag. I submitted them. You wanted a divorce, right? Well, now you have it. That divorce paper. It wasn't meant for that. Extend. What was it for? Michael didn't say anything. I assumed he wanted the divorce. You're not saying anything. Okay, I'll come by to pick up my things later. I hung up, but the calls didn't stop. Even when I was out looking for a room or job, the phone kept ringing. Just when I thought it had stopped, Noah called. I thought he might be calling because of Michael, but I couldn't ignore my son. I immediately answered the phone. Accusation? What's up? I'm mom. Dad told me you haven't come home. The come home? Well, your father and I are divorced. Didn't you hear Tyke Buxton? What divorced? Noah seemed unable to comprehend the news. Noah seemed unable to accept the fact that I had filed for divorce. Why? How could you all of a sudden? Your dad? Well, let's meet and talk about it. Can you come to the house today? I decided to call Noah home to explain the divorce to him and Michael in person. Noah agreed, and we met after his work to go home together. Michael was quite surprised to see me back without notice. Hey, as it's actually step. Why did you just leave all of a sudden? I entered the living room and sat on the sofa. Understandably, the other two were quite bewildered. Yes. Why did you suddenly decide on divorce? Well, because your dad filled out the divorce papers. Wait, dad did. Noah looked at Michael and cha. Michael appeared uncomfortable and evasive. Ah, that was not really serious. I saw your signature on it. It seemed pretty serious to me. I pointed out, and Michael looked down. I had evidence that made me believe those divorce papers were meant seriously. You know, you were cheating with Emily Thompson, right? Thanked. I knew about Michael's affair with Emily. It was obvious from how close they were and the excessive physical contact. I thought it was just because they were drunk, but I couldn't shake off my suspicions. Thinking there might be a chance, I peeked at Michael's phone while he was asleep. There, I found several intimate exchanges with Emily, and even photos from a hotel stay. I quickly took pictures of these evidences with my phone. As with photos of them together in a hotel, there's no way he could deny it. Cheating? No, that's not true. Don't bother denying it. I've evidence. Wait, precarious. When did you find it? When you were passed out drunk. I guess it's good. You're the type who falls asleep easily when drunk. Hearing this, Michael looked frustrated. But he soon raised his head and started making excuses. But really, I didn't mean to file those divorce papers. Emily told me to write them. I really didn't want to. I never wanted to divorce you, Linda. Oh, really? You wanted to keep me as a convenient housekeeper who does everything you say? A convenient woman who won't complain. That's not true. I really didn't want to divorce you. Michael kept insisting. Indeed, I thought, why would anyone let go of someone who does everything they say? But it didn't matter anymore. Chmo is the assistant. Adults should take care of themselves to some extent. No matter what Michael says, the fact that he referred to me as a housekeeper remains. They say the truth comes out when you're drunk, and it sure does. You know, even if you didn't intend to divorce, signing the divorce papers is considered as having that intention, right? Wait, really? You're old enough to know this, aren't you? Truly an embarrassing adult. I sighed without thinking. So that's that. Oh, and since you are cheating, I'll be getting alimony from both you and Emily, just so you know. Alimony? But of course, don't even think about running away. I'll consult a lawyer and make sure you face the consequences. Michael probably never imagined it would come to this. If he hadn't thrown his bag at me after the wedding, maybe things wouldn't have ended up like this. But then again, cheating and throwing bags at people is questionable behavior in the first place. It's a stark reminder of how one action can drastically change the course of your life.
Afterward, at Noah's suggestion, I decided to move in with him in his house. I was worried about being a burden, but he said no way. His wife likes you a lot, and I think she'd be happy to live with you. So I gratefully accepted his offer. I packed up my belongings from the house I'd no longer return to with Noah's help. I packed my clothes and watercolor painting tools into some cases and headed to Noah's house. Additionally, even until the last moment, Michael kept pleading, please reconsider the divorce. I'm begging you. But what was he thinking now? Cheating on me clearly showed he had no feelings left for me. I was genuinely relieved to be divorced from Michael. Later, I consulted a lawyer. Apparently, I could claim much more alimony than I expected due to the length of our marriage. I called Michael and Emily to the office, confirmed their affair and presented the evidence. Emily was initially confused and denied it, but after seeing the evidence, she admitted it. She should have just admitted it from the start. I thought of Emily as a genuinely nice person, so learning about the affair and the attempt to cover it up was quite shocking. By that time, Michael had resigned himself to the situation. I'm really sorry. I'll pay the alimony, he said. If only he had regretted his actions from the beginning. In the end, whether Emily was influenced by Michael or regretted her actions, she agreed to pay alimony and listened to the lawyer's explanation about it. Finally, they both apologized to me. Whether they truly regretted their actions or it was just for show, I couldn't tell. That was for them to know. But I hoped this experience would make them reconsider their actions and how much they hurt me. After the discussion, I returned home. Noah's wife welcomed me with a smile, which lightened my fatigue a bit. Since the divorce, I started working part-time near Noah's house. I was anxious about working again after so long, but the people at work were so kind that my anxiety sick. I'm getting along well with Noah and his wife. Lately, I've been enjoying cooking with her. The divorce is settled, and I have received the alimony that I am entitled to. Person, alimony? I thought everything was resolved. But then, one day, an unexpected encounter stirred things up again. It was Mitch. What shopping at the supermarket, I saw Mitch, likely returning from work. He noticed me and happily came over. Hello, that's vacation. It's long time no see Mitch. It's been a while. I greeted Mitch, and we chatted for a bit. We talked about recent happenings, work stuff, and what we were planning for dinner. But something about Mitch seemed off. He wasn't his usual bright self, almost desperate. Curious, I casually brought up a topic of conversation. Oh, Mitch. You seem a bit down. Are you okay? Ah, I obeyed. It seemed like I hit the nail on the head. As I waited for Mitch's response, he slowly began to speak. Oh, Sanchi. Recently, my girlfriend and I broke up. Oh, really? The girlfriend was Emily, who used to come over with me. What, I exteez? Emily. And he swore to stop to myself mid-sentence. But of course, Mitch seemed curious. Bridge did something happen? Since he asked, I told him about Emily and Michael, and how Michael and I got divorced. What? You got divorced? Yes, eh? We've been divorced for a while now. So what's why? I was wondering why I wasn't invited over anymore. Also, Mr. Smith, he still talks about his family at work, you know. Hey, Tomations. I couldn't believe Michael was still talking about us. Small, I instinctively held my head in my hands. I kind of realized Mr. Smith and Emily might be involved. Browns, they were always too close. Do you thought the same, Mitch? Oh, yes. Well, Mitch looked down awkwardly but soon looked up and said, I can't forgive Emily and Mr. Smith. I still report this to my supervisor. I was surprised that Mitch had noticed Emily and Michael's affair. Cheers, I thought I was the only one who knew. We parted ways that day, and he promised to let me know what happened later. Mr. Vectum 6, a few weeks later I got a text from Mitch. He must have reported Michael and Emily to his supervisor. Curious about the outcome, I immediately opened the email. It turned out Michael and Emily both received pay cuts, and Michael was also demoted, now working like a regular employee. Following Mitch's revelation, the affair between Michael and Emily became known throughout the company, and they were looked down upon. While Michael was still at the company, Emily, perhaps feeling uncomfortable, was a I was surprised Michael hadn't quit, but perhaps he realized he couldn't get a stable job elsewhere. I wondered how long he could keep it up. A year after the divorce and hearing from Mitch, he was still at the company. Michael and Emily continued to pay alimony, so they must be managing somehow. Mitch was recognized for his hard work and was promoted. 
Despite Michael once caring for his subordinate Mitch, his actions led to him becoming Mitch's subordinate. I wondered how that felt for him. I might be a bit curious for wanting to ask him that. Now, I'm living with Noah and his family, still working part-time at the supermarket. I started with stocking shelves, but now I'm learning to make delight items and use the cash register. It's nice to have new challenges every day. I'm getting along very well with Noah and his wife. We're planning to bake some sweets together today. I'm grateful for my kind workplace and loving family and continue to live my life with appreciation.